Hey guys, welcome back. So, for those of you who have been watching, um, I'm thrilled you all like the Theodoric and Justinian videos. However, I'm going to pause that series for a couple days um, and instead upload a few related videos. And the reason being is that, well, in the process of doing that particular series, it occurred to me that unless we cover, to some degree, what the post-Roman West looked like as Theodoric's armies were moving into Italy, and then as uh, Justinian's armies move into Italy, North Africa, and Spain, then we're lacking some context for the Justinianic reconquests. So, as you can tell, this is part one of six. I'm going to be doing six videos that are going to uh, intersect with the other series, and they're going to be talking about power structures, and the general development of the post-Roman West. So, as you can tell from the map in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, uh, post-Roman Europe, or Western Europe anyway, was, you know, fairly fragmented. It was also very decentralized. I would be very careful, by the way, with a lot of these borders. Um, we don't necessarily know, and I'll talk about this more in other videos, we don't necessarily know the exact borders of some of these states. We know each state had, like, this uh, core, this imperial center, and then gradually, uh, you know, control was lost the further out you went. Now, in some places, like post-Roman Britain, is there what we would understand to be, like, a dark age, a uh, genuine societal collapse? Absolutely. We have a lot of bioarchaeology, so, you know, skeleton evidence, that stuff, from post-Roman Britain, which shows on the bones uh, breaks, lesions, uh, severe evidence of malnutrition. We know the bones are thinner. We know people, you know, you needed more individuals to do the same amount of work that you needed less people to do maybe 100 years before. So Britain is definitely a bad area. Some places, like southern Gaul, like definitely northern Italy, definitely southern Italy as well, um... Uh, there was strong continuity here in terms of archaeological material, in terms of governing institutions like tax bases, uh, political structures, that kind of stuff. There are kings in this region. In some areas, like northern Gaul, eh, it's a bit of a mix, because there is societal collapse, there are a lot of groups of people running around, uh, there's a lot of aristocrats trying to refocus and restructure themselves. So in all cases, and this is something I'm drawing on uh, from this guy named Peter Brown, specifically his book, The Rise of Western Christendom. So if this interests you, that is something you should read, and we'll cover it in a book review in a later video. But in that book, um, what Brown talks about is that in the late imperial period, to be an aristocrat, uh, to be a noble, okay, your identity is closely tied up with the idea of the Roman Empire. Well, that goes away, so we see the creation of what Brown calls local Romes. Okay, so what are those? The idea is that, well, I'm a Roman aristocrat, I have this skill set, um, whatever it is. And I work in the government, I was a civil servant, I do taxes, or military command, or general bureaucratic work, anything related with the government. This is what these people did. When the barbarians come in, they see the existing governmental structures and they take it over. The problem is they don't know how to run things, so they have to work with the Roman aristocrats. Hence, we see local Romes. We see the Roman Empire, in terms of uh, continuity of political structure, built up locally. So gradually, what happened in the early medieval period is German culture and Roman culture blend and that's how we get the early medieval kingdoms, like Visigothic Spain, the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, Francia, etc. So in this video specifically, what I want to do is focus on peasants, villages, um, and, you know, social power dynamics. In doing so, we have two problems. Problem number one, uh, this is source material. From the early Middle Ages, we don't have tons of sources, but we have some, depending on where you look. Not Britain, but Italy, uh, what is today, France, Spain, like that area. Yes. Now, what are the problems with those sources? And as you can tell from this little chart I made, uh, the documents, the textual sources, tend to focus on the aristocrats and on the clergy. Why? Well, these were the people that were doing the writing. 
So this is the segment of society these documents are predominantly concerned with. Do they talk about the little guy, the peasant? Yeah. But then we have to ask, well, what do they describe about the peasant? Is it um, the in and out of peasant social structures? Of, um, you know, how peasants structure their estates, if they have estates, certainly how they structure their households, uh, what their folk beliefs are, stuff like that. The answer is no. They talk about peasants as viewed through the eyes, through the lens of the aristocrats and of the church. So then we know peasants existed, right, because they crop up in the documents, but we don't know too much about them. So then what source do we have for the peasants? And the answer is archaeology. The problem with archaeology is that it's not that it's biased like some texts are, it's that it's difficult to read in its own way because the archaeology is big picture. So you can excavate an entire village and you can say some stuff about peasant life, um, but what you can say about peasant life from material culture is going to differ drastically from what you might be able to glean from a textual source. Now, ideally, these things work best when they work together, as all sources do. Sometimes they don't, though, so we've got to be careful. These source problems become far more difficult, far more complex, when we try to uh, examine early medieval social structures. Now, here's the other problem with doing this. When we talk about the Middle Ages and social structures, I would be willing to bet a serious amount of money that some of you watching this, when I said that, your mind immediately said, ah, feudalism. That's how the medieval period was structured. This is how a lot of people that aren't specialists, um, including myself until I learned about it, view the medieval period. Why? Well, it's presented this way in textbooks and video games and other, you know, pop culture mediums. Um, it's an older method of understanding medieval social structures. And... You know, in a textbook for, like, high school or a survey college class, there's a lot you gotta cover, so stuff tends to get painted and covered with a broad brush, right? So if you don't specialize in this, or if you don't do, like, dedicated reading on the subject, um, that's probably how you conceive of this. For the past 30 years or so, past 35, 40 years-ish, specialists in medieval history have done one of two things. They've either completely rejected the feudal model, this idea that, well, the king, at least in theory, owns all the land, and he parcels it out to dukes, who partially let it out to other people, to other people, to knights, and then to peasants. The idea being that you go up through the chain, you get land in return for uh, military service. That's the social structure in the medieval period. That's been rejected, on the one hand. On the other hand, it's been argued, well, I mean, yeah, but it's not really useful for examining medieval societies, so it's just kind of pushed to the side. Why is this the case? Does this mean that feudalism never existed? Well, the answer is yes, but like at the same time, no. So this thing where you uh, exchange land for military service, that was real. The medieval people, they just called it vassalage. They didn't understand the term feudalism. That's a... Uh, model historians have created. Stuff like that existed. So it's not that the medieval period was or was not feudal, it's that the medieval period uh, has so many different social structures and so many different power dynamics that trying to look at one thing, one system, and applying it to everything is ahistorical. It's not correct. You're going to get a bad reading of the evidence. Um, so if you want to talk about the medieval period as feudal or vassalistic, you can do that, but you have to do so with the caveat, right? This is the famous tagline of the channel, as you have all reminded me in the comments. That's not wrong, but... It's not wrong, but we have to understand that medieval society develops feudal institutions like this in very specific parts of medieval Europe, like southern France, for example, in very specific time periods like the 1100s and the 1200s. And just because they show up in southern France doesn't mean they're applicable elsewhere. Italy, for example, basically doesn't do this. What are today the Low Countries? Basically don't do this. Anglo-Saxon England doesn't do this. The Frankish Kingdom of the Merovingians doesn't do this. Does France in the 1200s do this? Broadly speaking, yes. Does the Holy Roman Empire? No. It's a different social structure. 
There were elements in Central Europe that functioned that way, but there's more than one social structure running around. So, okay, then we have the problem. Well, if the medieval period should not necessarily be viewed as feudal, well then how, how do we understand social structures and power dynamics? Now the answer is, well, everything comes from land. But in the early medieval period, if there's no feudalism, well, what is there? And the answer is that as the Roman Empire broke up, as it disintegrated, and we see, you know, localization and, you know, societal decay, there are large, um, you know, aristocratic, let's just call them estates, large tracts of land in Merovingian Gaul, so in, like, northern France. There are some in southern France. There are some in Italy. But the norm especially in Italy, the norm across all of this, the norm across basically the entire post-Roman West is that the aristocrats own some land. The peasants own the rest. So it's not a system of the landlord, of, of the aristocrat just co-opting the peasant. Because when you want to deal with the peasant, you have to understand that the peasant, and thus the village, and we'll talk more about this in a minute, has their own bargaining chips. Why should they be placed under the protection of the lord, of the aristocrat, if they have stuff like, you know, all this land, all these resources, the village has its own militia, maybe there's a network of village alliances, well then you don't need the Lord's protection. Yet. That comes later. Um, but my point is that the peasants in the villages have bargaining chips. So any discussion of this has to keep this stuff in mind, and we have to understand that the bargaining chips are wealth, and that to grapple with medieval society in the post-Roman period, in the immediate post-Roman era, we have to understand how this stuff functioned. So what you're looking at in this map here, specifically the map of Britain on the right, all these red triangles, dots, things, these are uh, the distributions of villas in Roman Britain from the minute of the conquest to the withdrawal in like 410-ish. So the late Roman nobility are known as, you know, great landowners. Uh, there are potentially hundreds of acres, definitely dozens. These are usually termed like latifundia. Sometimes they're called villas. It depends what era of the empire we're looking at. Um, but in the late imperial period, there are oftentimes peasants called colony tied to these giant estates. In the late Roman nobility, what they do with all this wealth is they use it um, in this period to help bolster their militaries. So, on the one hand, like, yeah, there's the late Roman army. It has something like 350,000 men, at least it should, on paper anyway, um, in like 390-400. That's what it's got. But, things are kind of violent, so some Late Roman nobility use their wealth to build their own small personal retinues. These are um, supported via what are called benefices. So you're basically granting troops rewards like land, like food, to serve you. If you were granting these guys food specifically, then they are uh, bucalarii. It literally means like biscuit eaters. So these are armed guards, these like armed followings, if you want to think of them as like a war band or a comitatus or something like that who follow the noble in exchange for resources, in exchange for being fed. So my point with this is that late Roman nobles, not all of them, of course, but many of them are building these war bands. Um, and this is going on in the context of the barbarian migration slash invasions, depending on what group of people you're looking at. It's going on in the general context of gradual empire breakup uh, and, you know, military action warfare. So it's not surprising that we see a lot of these late Roman aristocrats becoming militarized or semi-militarized. Now, because they have all of these estates, this is just, you know, in Britain, for example, but they're all over the West, they're all over the Roman world. It should follow, then, that if these things survive into the early medieval period, and generally they do, um, it should follow that those land units exist in the new barbarian kingdoms, right? That would make sense. And it should then also follow, okay, that land becomes the determinant of wealth and power in the immediate post-Roman West. Well, as the evidence makes clear, it does. 
But again, and this is where we get to the problems of the feudal thing, it doesn't exist to the degree that like a feudal model requires. So then what is an existence in the early medieval period? And the answer is that, well, before I get to the answer, just for context, this is the, uh, in the map here, the Merovingian kingdom. This is the domain of the Franks after they come in and they take over like Roman Gaul. So in Merovingian Gaul, specifically northern and central Merovingian Gaul, upper level Frankish nobility, um, who eventually emerge out of a combination of like the Roman aristocracy and the Frankish warrior class, at least the upper Frankish warrior class anyway, they kind of merge. You see the uh, establishment of these gigantic estates, these massive amounts of land. So we have large amounts of land tenure in the immediate post-Roman West, but with the Frankish situation, they break up a lot because the way the Franks did succession was the household's stuff, land, money, whatever, was divided among the sons. They don't do primogeniture because they don't have to. There's not a need for it in their society. Um, so gradually the stuff breaks down, there are wars, people fight over it again, and you see this cycle happening among a lot of Merovingian nobles. So this is what we see in Gaul. In Italy, once the Lombards come in and they take over, um, we see a different situation. And this is, again, the key thing here. The social situation is so varied that it's really difficult to kind of paint this with a broad brush. It's wrong to do so. In Lombard Italy, we know the nobility, we know the elites held land, we know these people were in existence. Um, but unlike Frankish Gaul, where we have these big estates, in Lombard Italy, the estates are kind of small. In the surviving text, which admittedly, I mean, is not much, especially in the 700s, but, but you know, again, generally speaking, titles like Count, like Duke, the titles that we associate with medieval nobility, the owners of these great estates, it doesn't really show up too much in the documents. In Lombard Italy, in contrast to Frankish Gaul, the king appears to be, you know, fairly powerful. There are elites that own land, but the elites don't live on the land. They live in cities and they just happen to own landed estates. So in Lombard Italy, these elites who hold these Big pieces of land, right? Five to ten estates, roughly? Sounds like a big piece, and it is. But it stands in marked contrast to Merovingian Gaul, where five to ten estates, the largest of the Lombardic land holdings, are like the basis. It's like the bare minimum to be a high-ranking uh, Merovingian aristocrat. So what this means is that in Italy specifically, but also broadly in Gaul and Spain as well, um, elite power becomes tied more to the actual government offices, to actually being a member of the bureaucracy, to being a member of the court, rather than brute military force in the early medieval period. Not to say that military force is not important, it is, but it's not the sole or key determinant of social power and prestige. It comes, but it comes later. Visigothic Spain in this situation um, is similar. So then, if the land situation, if land tenure in most of Italy most of Spain, most of Gaul, if it's not held by nobles and kings, then what is it? And the answer is that, you know, it's held by everybody else. Peasants, merchants, um, small estate holders. Maybe you don't have hundreds of acres, maybe you own like two dozen. But in your local area, you are wealthy enough to be viewed as like a minor landlord. So my point then is that the social system doesn't look like this triangle here, right? This pyramid of feudalism, where everybody works toward the top. It looks more like this other thing I drew, um, you know, an interconnected web. Everybody is connected to everybody. It's not vertical so much as it, it's not vertical so much as it is um, both vertical and horizontal, that is three-dimensional. Everybody's tied to everybody in some way. So what that means for the peasants then is that because they own a lot of land, they have bargaining chips here in terms of, you know, trying to be co-opted by the elites. The elites have to offer them something somehow. They can't just go in with brute military force. And it also means because of that, okay, that there is greater peasant um, autonomy in the post-Roman West. In aristocratic estates, then, they tend... Central Gaul is a 
exception here because this is where large amounts of land were concentrated, but all across early medieval Europe, okay, aristocratic estates are checkerboarded. They're they're fractured. They're fragmented. Like you might be based, let's say for the sake of argument, in like Paris, but you own an estate right outside of Paris. It's kind of big, okay, but you own one like. 40 miles that way, 20 miles that way, uh, maybe your brother-in-law dies and you inherit something in, like, southern France. So, the problem is, well, you can exert authority over your immediate area, and maybe the estate 20 miles that way. How do you manage the stuff in southern France that you might have just inherited if your brother-in-law died? The answer basically is you don't. So, again, you know, this means the following for peasant autonomy and social relationships. It's three-dimensional. It's not just, a uh, simple bottom-up pyramid. There's a very complex system involved here. Now, because many aristocrats held these wide-ranging, far-flung estates, I mean, yeah, technically that means they were everywhere. Technically. But, like, not really. Like, you might be a peasant and you might live on the land owned by a certain lord. Okay. But if that lord, you know, let's say the estate's in southern France, if that lord is in Paris, I mean, how are they going to get to you? Theoretically, they could have somebody managing the land, but what if they don't? These are the problems associated with trying to work out early medieval power dynamics, because these are the situations on the ground. So, to obtain protection, right, I mean, technically, because the Lord is everywhere, peasants, technically, uh, would enter into terms of service with the nobles, with the aristocrats. But at the same time, for every peasant that did this, there was one that did not. So if there's no lord nearby you enter into service with, maybe you go into service with a monastery or a nearby church. Or you tie yourself to another local village. You build a, not a confederacy, but an alliance network. So these are the different power structures that are slowly cropping up in the post-Roman West. Now we have a couple different examples of what these different power structures look like. So a good example of a peasant community tying itself to a monastery would be the monastery of uh, Saint Germain. It's now within Paris, but in this period it was nearby. So we have records here surviving from like the 800s and a little bit into the 900s, which detail the names of entire village communities. All the men, all the women, all the children, who got married in what year, what births were in what year, who died in what year, who owed what taxes, uh, who promised this to this guy, who didn't pay their taxes, maybe who absconded. This stuff exists in these documents, and oftentimes this stuff survives kind of by chance. Um, but my point is that it makes it very clear that the village and this local peasant society was tied to the monastery, not the aristocrat. So again, we have that problem with the feudal model. Again, it's not that it didn't exist, it's that we can't conceive of it as being the end-all be-all for medieval society because it's not that simple. Now, the majority of the peasants on this estate were probably unfree, by which I mean they would tie to the land, but they're either tied to the land by each other or to the monastery, not held in serfdom to the aristocrats. No matter where you look in the post-Roman West, all villages, again, no matter where you are, they have a mix of, you know, free and unfree people. You could be living side by side, and you can be a free peasant, and your neighbor could, like, be a serf. Maybe he has to do certain things during the year that you don't. Or maybe you're free, and a chunk of your family is not. So it gets pretty complex pretty quickly, but then we have to ask the question, right? Well, if the majority of the unfree peasants aren't tied to aristocrats outside of a nominal, super loose kind of idea, well then, who are the unfree tied to? And the answer is they're tied to locals. So the village of Gorsdorf, which is in France, is an excellent example here because, again, we have documentation surviving. So Gorsdorf exists within this thing, this kind of three-dimensional web of power structures. So we have a monastery, we have a duke nearby, and in the village itself, we have a town council made up of the free. So these are the guys that aren't tied down to anybody. These are the local landowners. Now, the council, these guys own the unfree peasants. And because they have that power, because they're free, they exercise influence over the village. So when the monastery or the noble wants to do something, they have to deal with this town council. 
I mean, technically by 800, the monastery is fully in charge. But my point, okay, is that there is a power dynamic the noble has to go through here. They have to deal with the town council. At the same time, in Brittany, so this chunk of France inside of the yellow box, um, there's a different power dynamic going on. So in the early medieval period, Brittany, yeah, it had princes. Sometimes they called themselves kings, but whether or not we should understand them to be kings is questionable. They didn't really have that much power. Um, but they existed. But their power is really decentralized. It's very weak. What exists instead are these networks, okay, of villages bound in alliance with each other. And because these villages exist in alliance networks, they come equipped with law courts, trade networks, militia, so they have the ability to wage war and fight. So if an aristocrat wants to come in and take this stuff by force, it's not going to be easy. So the better way of doing this is to negotiate, and gradually through negotiation, this stuff is brought to heel. So, again, to reiterate my point, the social situation in post-Roman Europe is extremely complex. This is what Justinian and Theodoric are going to be encountering as their armies move through these areas. We also have villages uh, like Plaiso. I hope I pronounced that correctly. I don't speak French. If you do and I said it wrong, let me know, please. Um, but anyway, this place is a village that's located near modern-day Paris. This place is actually dominated by a noble, by an aristocrat. So then in summary, we have at least five uh, power structures or five contenders for power in the post-Roman West. Elites and their lands. Villages dominated by elites. Villages in a vast, multi-pronged power network. Villages in their own power network and monasteries. So all of these units, they use land. So how do they use it? If lords didn't have all the power, what do they do? In order to understand that, we have to understand that between about 500 and about 800, 840, 850, like that period, village autonomy in the post-Roman West is at its uh, zenith. It's at its greatest extent, after which we get to more of a dominated by single lord military kind of system. Many of those villages, many of those peasants, yeah, they pay a nominal tax to somebody. Um... Maybe they should have. We don't really know if everybody did all of the time because tax systems don't really exist in the early medieval period in the way that we envision them. Governments aren't that, uh, you know, far-reaching. But just because, you know, there is that village autonomy, that doesn't mean these are like these glorious egalitarian communistic kind of societies. Within the villages, power is often gendered. So we have man's work. They plow, they harvest, they fight. And we have women's work. They weave, they manage the household. Um... And we know they managed the household, and we know this gave them a great amount of power, because graves from the 6th century, they're buried with keys. So we see in the archaeology, they have the power of the house and the power of the purse. You want a divorce? Okay. Woman takes everything not nailed down. That sucks. And women are also responsible for the harvest. Villages use the land... And lords use their land to try to outdo one another and sometimes to work together. And the basis of all of that is agriculture. So the Arab conquests and then the domination of the Arabs in Spain, uh, it leads to the spread of stuff like irrigation tech, new farming techniques, but it does it very slowly. At the same time, this uh, little diagram I have here shows what's called the three-field system. It shows up around 1100, and it's part of what leads to uh, what's called the medieval agricultural revolution. Rather than dividing the land in half and farming one plant and then leaving the other half of the field fallow, you cut it into thirds and you rotate it. So that as the years go by, you get more and more um, bang for your buck. You get more produce grown because you're using two thirds of the land at any one time, not half. Before this develops, Stuff is more decentralized in terms of uh, economic planning. Now, some villages, we have documents which suggest they had some kind of a communal planned economy. The town council collectively decides how to use the land. Generally, though, that land was individually owned. So again, that land represents resources. So if you want to use those resources as a bargaining chip, you have to have a good deal to get it. Otherwise, you're not going to entice the peasants or you're not going to convince the lord to go do something. So, gradually, land gets bequeathed to monasteries or lords in exchange for protection, or 
tax reductions, you know, things of that nature, and at the same time, the use of land could also be restricted by those same villagers if they're not feeling they're getting a good deal, or if the lords of the monasteries did something they don't approve of. So, oftentimes, lords could be held hostage to the village. This is something you don't really hear about in, you know, textbooks and more popular takes on the medieval period. This is a serious power dynamic. The peasants have a lot of power. So then what this means for uh, exchange networks and power dynamics is that there is no top-down pyramid. It does come, again, to a degree, but it comes after the late 900s. Why will be covered in a separate video. Uh, but to get back to my point, we have to explore in a couple other videos a related point to land and power structures in the Middle Ages, and that is that when Justinian's armies are conquering these regions, these are areas where, you know, the court documents or the law courts where they survived tell us that, you know, yeah, there were things like dukes and counts, and there's a, a general post-Roman air about the whole thing, because these are Roman titles. Um, but the kings, the leaders, derive their authority from the villages and from the aristocrats, because they derive their ability to rule from the consent of the free, from the power of the free. For most of Frankish, Lombardic, and Visigothic and Anglo-Saxon society in this period, um, there's not a clear dividing line between I'm a duke and you're a peasant. Well, okay, that existed. But the more fine-grained stuff in between the extremes, it's not clear where one title ended and something else began. So, my point is that early medieval Europe, the power structures, the power dynamics are very mixed, the very... Uh, blurred, depending on where you look. So peasants and villages then have military power, and the kings and lords usually can't just go in and take what they want. So during Justinian's reconquests, one of the reasons why that becomes like the key dividing line um, for when late antiquity ends and the medieval period begins is that, at least in the Mediterranean, it sends shockwaves through the system, which in more ways than one, change how the societies begin to be structured. It takes a while, but it's present. It's there. So we'll pick up with this in the next video, guys. I hope you all enjoyed. Take care. I will see you all next time.